This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. Can you guys hear me? I got popped out for a second. Yeah, me too. Yep, we all did. Hey, James. Hey, hey. How are you doing? Great. Wow, you have a great voice. Oh, you think? Thanks. It's always weird, though, because I never, like, and people say this about me all the time, like, it's so weird whenever you've heard somebody's voice or you've talked to them for something forever. And then you actually like, it's even weirder when you're actually around them. And it's like, Oh, this, this doesn't <laughs> fit at all. What I said, <laughs> like when somebody, when we made that little video for uh, the Patreon thing, somebody commented and they're like, Oh Lord, actually I kind of had in my head, you guys switched as far as what you looked like in your voices. So <laughs> this is, this is a problem now. Yeah, they suggested that we the next time we do a video that we should lip sync each other. So. <laughs> so I suppose I expected uh, you guys to sound swapped at, at, at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they said that, I was like, well, which one of us should be offended by that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my wife just said, tell, tell Mike I love his website. Oh, really? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's sweet. That's weird doing this art shit. You know, anytime anybody in, has some enthusiasm, it's nice to hear. Oh yeah, you guys have been getting some enthusiasm. I love that review you posted. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cool. No, that's. I mean, especially when we figured, like, when we started, we joked, we're like, okay, probably Jordan and Wits will listen. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe somebody else. I don't know, but but yeah. All right. Well, y'all ready to get started? Yep. Okay. Well, let me give a little intro. You want to do it? Craig? No, I'll let you do it. You got it down. Uh, <laughs> no, I can do it. I can do it. That's, 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 that's. All right. So welcome to another one of our reader interviews where we ask five questions. And hopefully by this point, people know what those questions are. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. They're, they're the same. They haven't changed. But this week we have, uh, if you were on the earth list, you'll recognize them as son of wits. In my head, I always call him wits. And I don't know, how would how would you like us to refer to you? Oh, uh, Son of Wits is good, or Mike is fine. Uh, <laughs> Wits has always been the sort of nickname that other people have used, so it works for me. That's how I came across the the longer pseudonym I use. Gotcha, gotcha. But yeah, if you've been posting on Facebook or, or on the Earth list, Mike Benowitz has done a lot of stuff, and, and hopefully you've seen some of his art. has some great early, you said it was like an early concept draft of uh, a comic version of Shadow, right? Yeah, I, I spent a good number of uh, a couple of years actually working out uh, what was essentially a script and a very poorly drawn rough draft of where I wanted to go with it. I hadn't been drawing comics in a while, so I was sort of and I was also using a, the first generation iPad to draw that thing. So I don't know if you've seen it. It looks like it's drawn with a crayon because it essentially was with one of those like rubby little rubbery little styluses, mostly on art, hacking that thing out, just trying to get myself back into the world of drawing comics again. And uh, when I was doing that. But anyway, that's a whole whole thing that I eventually hung that up, (laughs) which is which I got to say is too bad because somebody every now and then will dig that up and they'll post it on Facebook um, or something and i know it's popped up a few times and anytime it does everyone's like oh wow is there more of this so i wish there was i wish there was more but i totally understand how um yeah not not having the market or the money up front to actually pursue an entire comic book that's gotta be yeah it's a lot of time yeah yeah and i i wish it i i wish it could continue to i have fond uh memories of working on that thing that's actually my initial a burst of enthusiasm for this book was all wrapped up in that. And I went way too deep into it. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) That sentence is grammatically correct, but it has no meaning to me. (laughs) I know that, that everyone's probably seen at least one of Mike's works because his, uh, he created our logo for us. That's right. For which we are eternally grateful. (laughs) Well, it was my pleasure. Uh, I really, uh, enjoy the podcast quite a bit. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, let's jump into the questions and this is free form. Anything you want to say, feel free um, as much or as little. So, so what was your first encounter with a wolf story? I'd have to say I got the disease spread from Jordan Flato, uh, who I believe was your first interview reader interview. Mm-hmm. And he's a great guy who's become a really close friend of mine. 
And we were friends on the Web of Mimicry forum, which was a mailing list for Secret Chiefs and Mr. Bungle related fandom. Uh, we were on there for a number of years before we uh, he moved into my neck of the woods and we started eating lunch together. At some point, he turned me on to the book. Uh, I think a lot of us there at Web of Mimicry got really into the book because it was a weird mix of a weird mix of nerds there and a lot of theology thrown into the mix where um, we were constantly talking about symbolism and theology in those discussions because that's one of the things that the uh, Secret Chiefs music is loaded with. And the, I was working on the art for that, so my head was completely wrapped up in symbols. And me and Jordan would have these lunches where we would just talk about the books endlessly, which is what led me into drawing the books. And Jordan and I would go to lunch and uh, I would give him usually ahead of time, I'd give him a copy of the script as I was working it out because I was being really faithful to the novel, but I had to excise quite a bit of text, obviously. So I was trying to figure out what was essential and occasionally smash some sentences together and cut others out. So I would pass it to Jordan and then we'd meet up for lunch and talk about how to make this thing work. So it was this huge amount of enthusiasm spread to me by him and the camaraderie of having someone to talk about this great book with allowed me to get into it in a depth that I don't normally get into other books. I'm not, there's no other fandom. I don't think that I'm really that obsessed with as this book. You know, anyway, that I owe it to Jordan for that. And, and some of the discussions in that, that, Mr. Bungle group too. And uh, I was just listening to Jordan's podcast, uh, No Means No, No Means Nothing. I don't know exactly how to say it. No Means No Thing or No Means Nothing about the band No Means No, uh, right before we were, while I was waiting for this to get going. So that's a good thing worth checking out if you like No Means No and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think from what some people have said, yeah, I think there are definitely a lot of sort of well, people who aren't huge fandom. Like there are lots of people who are sci fi or fantasy readers and whatnot, but. Yeah, as far as like diving in the deep end, yeah, you know, I think a lot of people, but but it is. I mean, like tearing up one book or one writer in a lot of detail is different from cosplay <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely have a you know a lot of things I'm interested in, but I've I've never nerded out quite so hard. Although I have had this sort of stupid hubristic idea of trying to adapt novels uh, into comic form. I don't know why I. I my entire life in high school, I was constantly thinking I was going to, and I was working on these things. I was writing scripts and doing breakdowns and character designs for all. And they were always bookstop novels too. Uh, would doorstop novels. That's what I mean to say, you know, like it, Stephen King's it or Clive Barker's a magica. I wanted to do as graphic novels and it's just idiotic. Well, everyone who loves a book likes to imagine that they're, that, that it they could see it in some sort of visual form. Everyone starts casting the movie for the book that they that they really love. So that's that's not really all that different, really. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see that. Magica. That I would love to see. That's a book <laughs> that I wish more people had read. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, except that when you actually have the talent to draw <laughs> and to draw well and to bring that bring that vision to reality, that's pretty cool. That's yeah, well, that's one of the reasons I kind of stopped doing that book, too, because I realized I, I don't have the chops qu quite as much as I think I have the chops. <laughs> <laughs> Comics are hard to do. Oh, you should do it all with your, you know, with your little drippy skull zombie people. That would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Every character yeah. has a drippy skull. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm too all over the map as an artist. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sitting here in like an Imagica reverie because it's been so long since I read that that book. But that's such an it's an amazing book. And but it's been it's been decades. Oh, I love that book. I had to go back and reread it, and it holds up. It does. Okay, good. It's a really really solid book because I remember I read it a long time ago and have always been fascinated with it, but I've never gone back and reread it. Now I think any fan of these novels would uh, do well to read Imagica. It's it's lesser, you know. It's it's not the same sort of thing exactly. It's not very Wolfian, but there's that's quite in the scope and the type of fantasy and the the maturity of the fantasy, mm -hmm. I guess you'd say. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. love that cool. book. Well, what was what would you say your favorite novel or short story 
Either one or both would be. Uh, yes, predictably, it's Book of the New Sun as a whole. I just adore the novels. The favorite, my favorite volume is Sword of the Lictor, and I guess we'll probably get into that some here later with the theory part. But uh, I just, you know, I wasn't a. I don't know. I was really enthralled with the first read and I got to the end of the fourth volume and was just like, what the Religion. F- I, you, what the hell was that that I just read? <laughs> and, uh, you know, luckily Earth was on hand. I don't know mm-hmm. that I would have really gotten it so much without Earth making some things plain. Uh, maybe Jordan would have spoiled things for me and I would have gotten it, you know, but uh that earth is where it all really clicked in. I mean, I love the entire solar cycle. It's all great. And, and I, some of the, the best moments are when certain arcs culminate that are standing on the, the shoulders of all the various books, the, some of the things that happen in the final parts of uh, short sun that just blow my mind. And, you know, of course you, you can't get there without all of the books. And so I, I love all of the books really. But, but specifically Sword of the Lictor is the baddest, most badass one. Yeah. And definitely, I mean, just kind of not to be too on the nose, but it's it's definitely the most visual, I feel like, of the books, like in terms of just variety of places and settings and things that you can visualize. Like I can I can kind of see, I mean, that's it's honestly, it's probably my favorite yeah. too because it's the one that that feels most, free to me like to explore the world in a lot more ways like the other ones are more are so more focused on particular problems or or severe going to war or something like that but sword has this like expansive openness where every time you you turn to a new little episode there's a whole different aspect of the world yeah it's kind of like uh like in star wars they always they have a jungle planet they have an ice planet they have you know they have a water planet <laughs> and you know in in sort of lictor you have you you go from the tops of the mountains and meet El Zabo. You go you're you're down. You start the the story in the dungeons of Thrax. You you go up and you meet uh, Typhon and then the castle with you know the, the mad scientist and his monster. Yeah, there's a whole journey through that landscape. Mm-hmm. And in terms of what you were saying, Craig, about the most visual, you're you're absolutely right. Although I think it would be a hard sell to do visually because. So much of the beauty of this work is its ambiguity. And when you get into visuals of it, you're mm-hmm. you're selling certain things too soon in a way. Like if you show the rockets, you know, it's better to kind of understand that they're rocket ships later almost. Uh, but uh, one the one work that I, of Wolf's that is my next favorite, I guess, uh, but I, I've only read it through once uh, and I don't understand it very well is the soldier in the mist series, all of the last books. And I think those would make for amazing long form television. I mean, that could be a, just a wonderful show. And I think people would love it without needing to know all the mysteries. You could do that. A a wonderful, like period sort of historical fiction type television show with that these days. And just, wow, it would be amazing. Oh yeah. And I can imagine you already have the opening of every episode done because he has to be sitting there reading what he wrote <laughs> to be like, who am I again? Yeah, every right. day. Yeah. Yeah. Good episodic <laughs> form format. Exactly. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's narrow it down. What do you think your favorite wolf word is? Okay. Well, originally I was going to say autark. But then I re- was was thinking about it this morning, and I remembered that no, I learned that that word from a magica from the Clive Barker work. Oh, is that in there? Yeah, actually, in fact, I think that a magica is Clive Barker having read Book of the New Sun and deciding to do his own sort of perverted take on the Christ mythos. Interesting. <laughs> so he has the autark in there, and uh, not to spoil anything too much, it's also an old book. The unwitting protagonist is related to the autark in a very intimate and close way. So yeah, I had learned that um, that book that word from him. So I moved on to Alzebo, which is just I love the whole thing. I love the monster. I love the sound of the word. I love that the whole monster and name itself feels like an authentic coinage. Like it's like it should be added to 
you know, all these various B series like the Dungeons and Dragons book, you know, so many different fictions, you come up with a monster and it's a monster that you know mm-hmm. from somewhere else before. It's a vampire or a dryad or, a, you know, all the different things that exist. But somehow Alzebo yeah. seems like a really unique one to me. And I just love the monster and the name. Another contender there, again, just being introduced by. Also, I think Alzebo is a coinage of. Uh, wolves as well right that's one of those uh almost a neologism. from what we can figure out yeah there's there are there are connections and similar ish things but i think the actual spelling and the word is wolves yeah no but no it's a it's it's a um it's an old word for hyena there's apparent uh, apparently an aramean uh word for hyena is zabo or t with a ts a B O. So then you include the, there. yeah. So it still feels like a pretty good, almost neologism. Uh, my other words that I love in there uh, are ones that he just pointed to archaic words. Uh, I love Arctother and smile it on. And uh, I know Stuart Ham just mentioned those. Hi, Stu. All right. So what is your personal non-consensus favorite theory about a wolf story or just your favorite one in general? So, I took that to mean what's my what's because I have a personal theory here that I haven't heard hadn't heard anybody talking about. I've talked to you guys a little bit about it. So that's how I took the question. I don't know if that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Um, So I don't know how much I should get into it. It has to do with the the vertical orientation, uh, like a vertical hierarchy of Severian's enemies that he encounters throughout the the novels, specifically Sword of the Lictor. Should I kind of dive into it much? I know you guys talked about it a little bit on this. Show. Yeah, not everyone it. will have remembered it or have heard it. So yeah, but no, definitely. Okay, well, so uh, as much of the books, uh, the the three books are him casting off the various authorities for you know exterior authorities. Sword of the Lictor finds Severian overcoming a series of all these enemies, and all of those antagonists represent classic denials of God and God's gifts. You don't have to be overly hung up on God to believe in this. I think it's just symbol symbolism, really. Okay, so in metaphysics and metaphysical symbolism, verticality often represents orientation to the infinite, right? It's not always just up and down. It's like an orientation to God. Um, The horizontal would be normal, mundane time in history. Anyway, so after the beginning part of Sword of the Lictor, he escapes Thrax and goes into the mountains, which is the sort of beginning of this vertical situation and i love that it's called into the mountains he kind of calls attention that he's thinking about this allegory so he ascends vertically and then he falls down not he doesn't fall down he almost falls over that huge cliff and then he has to climb down quite a bit to where he meets casdo right and so i love that he he goes he goes into the mountains and has this amazing orientation to like the heavens and he sees a constellation which is the amphisbena and i think that that's the most appropriate symbol to severian because it's the dragon the two-headed dragon where the tail is feeding on the head of the other one it's not the same as the ouroboros it's a more complicated symbol that relates to the the sort of time loop death and resurrection stuff that's in this book. So he kind of claims this complicated constellation that's himself. And then that's when he goes down. Then the next day he wakes up and he goes down the cliff and he has this, the descent he, it's a cutaway of this geological time scale with that cliff, right? Where he just, he's going through hundreds of years of history of human, the garbage of human history. And he comes to the bottom and he meets, has this little uh, hut where he meets Kazdo. And that's like, and little Severian, it's, that's like an example of like base default humanity, like with nothing else, no technology, as long as there's humans, there's going to be some people in the woods trying to make a living. And so it's like humanity at its most humble without all that garbage of accreted history, right? So then uh, that's when he encounters the Alzebo. And 
I'm not exactly clear on the Alzebo. I think that the Alzebo somehow represents, you know, fiends that would prey on those humble families of Earth. It's very low. And so this is a low level on this hierarchy, vertical hierarchy of enemies, right? So then he, I think he goes slightly downhill again in the in the text where he then meets the zoanthropes. And uh, they're an example of uh, humanity that would reject their sort of God-given humanity. They they throw away through their, uh, I believe they get like lobotomies to yeah something something like that to, yeah. to render their humanity and just become mm-hmm. beasts, which is why they're zoan through beast men or whatever. Although I always picture them with animal heads. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to go wait. Do they have animal heads? No, they don't. I think it's in Warhammer 40k. There's a there's a thing called a zoanthrope that's this weird like lizard centaur thing and unfort that's what i always have in the back of my head whenever he says that. <laughs> <laughs> totally wrong but yeah anyway so i i think that's like their you know that that their rejection of that humanity makes them one of these worthy enemies that way in in, in terms of this rejection of god uh because each one of these enemies is like an allegory of a type of rejection of God. Um, then you get next, he goes to the circle of sorcerers as he goes up further into the mountains. And um, they're trying to prevent the coming of the new sun with sorcery and fakery. So those represent the dark arts aimed at the mastery of the mundane world, a corruption of magic and power. And so they'd, pre- they'd you know prevent that coming and they'd prevent that resurrection if they could. So, uh, and that resurrection being part of whatever God's plan or whatever. So that, that makes them one of the enemies there. Then, then at the very summit of the mundane world, you get Typhon and he's clearly an analog for Satan offering the whole kingdom of earth to Jesus, you know, like Jesus, Severian rejects the offer. And then he's also got a Moloch like quality as he's drinking little Severian's life energy. Then you go down the hill to uh, the next enemy, which is Baldenders. Down the hill, sorry. You go down the mountain to Lake Diaturna. Uh, Baldenders is the epitome of scientific materialism, right? He's like the Omega Point scientist who would storm the gate of heaven. He's post-enlightenment reasoning like cancer. So that's, uh, you know, the sort of post enlightenment rejection of God there. And so Severin has to overcome him. And then after that, he loses the claw, this, this cross that he's been carrying terminus S breaks, and he's now fully on his own and fully oriented to the increate. And he can go on to the next, you know, stage of his thing. There is another, uh, another enemy here would be the Ashians. They come up in the next book. I see them as an allegory of communism. This is where I think Wolf is working out his Korean stuff, uh, Korean war stuff, not Korean race stuff. So I see the Ashians, uh, I don't know how to say it, Askians. There's got to be a pronunciation fight music. I was thinking you guys should have pronunciation fight. There, we have, we have, we have, and, and so many of these words. Once you get start figuring it out, try. Well, what's the real pronunciation? Well, you know, it really, it really all depends. Yeah, every time you say Gerlois, I kind of lose my shit. <laughs> <laughs> we switch over as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I think we did it first when we kind of started. Yeah, and then we then we just agreed to disagree on some of it. But so um, I think maybe the the Ask Askians are even sort of higher than Baldenders in this hierarchy because they're a sort of godless humanity that's systematized into you know uh, humanity. I think they're the they're the humanity that gave up their wild side, which as a Kiriaka that mentions that in the sort of fable like telling of the history of Earth, humanity gave up their wildness. That the I think it's the Rodules give back to them, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, then yeah. I guess Abi mm-hmm. and Erebus would fit into this. Obviously, very low, and I think that has to do with the sort of monotheistic bias, as opposed to the Abia, Abia and Erebus uh, seem to represent sort of polytheism or you know the the sort of god that is everywhere and nowhere aspects of uh, Islam. So that's kind of the basics of it, and I really think that that vertical structure is baked into the plot. And I just love the way I, it goes through the whole book, but just the way the entire ideas of this thing are really so baked into the plot. It just 
blows my mind. Well, no, and I when you've talked about that before, it to me it helped particularly with Baldanders because that was one of my questions. Was there times in the book where it seems like Baldanders is supposed to be Severian's, you know, antagonist, but then he's not when when all is said and done. It's like he is for a while, but he's not the ultimate antagonist or something. So when you talked about that, it actually helped me clear up a bunch of things about you know why why he's important, but maybe why he's not the apex of. It's confusing because you don't think about him as a scientist much of the mm-hmm. time you know him. You don't think about him as a smart, you know, megalomaniacal genius. Mm-hmm. You think of him as this lumbering beast. And uh, it's not until you really see that that scene in the third book when you've known this character for through three, you know, to some degree through three books. It's like, oh, he's supposed to, he's this mad scientist, Frankenstein in reverse. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. A, little, a little strange. Well yeah. done, yeah. but it's awesome. It's but that's very good. That's that's way better than I think uh, we tried to do once. <laughs> so which, which well, I, think, gosh, I think basically I mean, what also, we said is, yeah, I think we said like go, go read this thing. Right, Mike came to play. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, I, I probably t- we're already thirty minutes in here. I think I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's worth it. Don't <laughs> worry. There's, people, there's no time. Limit. And people who uh, are listening to this will enjoy the explanation. All right. Hopefully, okay. so, yeah. Um, cool. All right. Then uh, last one. What to you is one of the most frustrating mysteries or confusions in a wolf story or book? Okay. Well, I'm no longer frustrated by it, but I was very frustrated by it at the beginning. And it, and it kind of ties into this, uh, wh- whether Severian is you know, a Christ figure or whether he's a Christ-like figure. And um, I'm kind of giggling about it in my head here as I think about it because uh, – Craig, you were one of the first people who really brushed up against it very hard when I posted this back in the Earth list. I was looking up, looking up old posts, and I found you being the the one res- oh, really? responding, <laughs> oh, pushing I don't very hard against some of the. Yeah, it was great. And so, you know, one thing I love about this uh, this fandom is how long so many of us have been friends, despite having argued vociferously about something. <laughs> you know, I, like I, pretty fun, but yeah, so. I came on hot and heavy about that Severian was basically a a manifestation of the Logos, and uh, people very much rejected that, I think, based on uh, two things. One you were arguing against was uh, arguing for, which is something I've learned to appreciate, is how how great the books are because of the ambiguity that makes them readable without believing anything is d- divine is going on at all right like you can read these books from a there's nothing divine happening it's all uh manipulation by aliens and robots whatever the hell they are and you were really pushing to not you know to, to, to keep the books open for that and i think i was frustrated because you and and not you so much but i felt like other people there we're getting hung up on the idea of like, well, if Severian's Christ, how does that change my understanding of Christ? And whereas I have a really loose, I'm not a religious person. I have a really loose understanding of Christ, right. sort of cosmic Christ idea almost that actually is somewhat informed by this book. And I think that's why I was somewhat zealous about that understanding when I when we first started talking about this thing. But uh, I, I do see him as an instance of the logos and i don't think that that means that he's like a perfectly divine figure i guess like jesus is supposed to be you know like i don't think that you know when you participate if you as a person sort of participate as a an instance of a mythic archetype you don't necessarily manifest every aspect of that. You manifest what is necessary. Like Aramini talks about justice and the universe is designed to bring justice eventually, that evil becomes good somehow. I, I feel like the Logos is that. It, that's It's what relates man to God, right? Like that. the old Greek understanding of the Logos had it more as a ratio between man and God, right? And I think it's very telling that... Severian's carrying this cross through the whole books. I mean, that that sword, the giant sword he's got on his back is very much a cross. And it's got on it, it says, you know, the dividing line. And I think of 
ratio as a dividing line, right? I mean, even it's in math, right? If you look, if you write out a ratio, well, you can do it as with a colon or you can do it with a division symbol. I, I see, you know, it's almost like a play on words there. And so Severian participating in that logos energy in the sense of Philip K. Dick had novels about this sort of thing. And I don't know, I'm kind of rambling because I don't, I, I, my mind was very much wrapped up in all the theology of and symbolism of this stuff when I was writing about this about 10 years ago. <laughs> I don't think about this stuff too much anymore, so I'm a little rusty with it. But um, that has frustrated me. What continues to frustrate me in these uh, theories is people wondering whether or not the flooding of earth is a good act, whether it's moral or just, and that like, you know, if Severian's Christ, no, he's an antichrist because he destroys earth or something like that. And that reading to me frustrates the hell out of me because I feel like the point of this novel is to show that it needs to be done, that earth needs to be washed clean. Essentially all this stuff needs to be flooded away and just started over. And we get that. And we, we see him starting a new, you know, humanity's not over. It's not, it's not the end of humanity. It's just a necessary death and rebirth, which is this whole thing is death and resurrection. It starts with death. The first chapter is called death and resurrection. And the first page goes on to talk about death and resurrection with symbols again and again. So I think, and there's the whole secret of the guild, which is that a, a torture simply obeys, right? Isn't that the secret? And so the, you know, like Christ kind of had to bring this came to bring the sword, you know, Severian came to bring the sword and it was necessary for a, a torturer who's going to obey to do this horrible, terrible job that needed to be done. And to me, that that message of the book is so clear that when people are like, oh, he's a bad guy because he destroyed Earth. It's terrible. I just I just don't. I just can't go there. No, he's a hand of God, right? <laughs> yeah. Which uh, I don't want anybody to think I'm some total religious nut or anything either. Because I'm definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> well, that is not a discrediting feature. At yeah. this <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. And I appreciate and respect all of the uh, opinions and education I've gotten from other people who've uh, decided to push back against the various ideas I wrote back there on the earth list. That's awesome. Excellent. Well, cool. That's a lot of good stuff. So Wits, thanks for talking to us. This was again, entirely sponsored by the patrons of the rereading wolf podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash rereading wolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world. And if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out to us by email or one of the other methods listed in the show notes of this episode.